Greenhouse Management Magazine. And joining us today are Joseph Ratzko and Blair Busenbark of Mycorrhizal Application. Over the next hour, they'll be telling us all about why mycorrhizae are important for plant vitality and how these symbiotic organisms can help improve plant nutrient uptake and utilization, increase nutrient availability, maximize water utilization, build soil structure and health, and much, much more. So just a few notes before we get started. We're gonna have time for Q&A at the end of the webinar. So please be sure to enter any questions you might have into the question box on the right-hand side of your screen and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. We're also recording today's webinar and we'll be posting it online in a few days. Everyone who registered will re receive a link via email, so please feel free to go back and watch again, go over anything you might have missed, um, and share with your colleagues. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So thanks so much for joining us, Joseph and Blair. Perfect, thank you very much. Well, welcome everyone. First of all, thank you for joining this technical webinar today about mycorrhizal fungi and their use in ornamental production. Blair and myself are going to talk about mycorrhizal fungi in general and how they can help nurseries and greenhouse growers. And also, we would like to spend some time explaining the use of mycorrhizal inoculant products, the product choice, you know, how these products can be integrated in um, the growing practices in ornamental production. And at the end of the presentation, Blair will discuss the economics of mycorrhizal inoculants. But then let's get started. So approximately 95% of uh, all land plants depend on the mycorrhizal fungi. And uh, mycorrhizal fungal relationship is an ancient and, and, and fundamental um, relationship. In fact, in natural habitats, the presence of mycorrhizal fungi on the roots of plants is almost as common as chloroplasts in the leaves um, of plants. Um, mycorrhizal fungi form a mutualistic relationship with plant roots, allowing them to access more water and nutrients. And in return, the plants provide carbon in the forms of sugars and lipids, for instance. So everybody is happy in this, uh, in this relationship. Besides the nutrient and, and the water uptake benefits, the plants receive protection from the fungus during stressful conditions, such as drought stress, salinity stress, or heavy metal toxicity uh, stresses. The mycorrhizal fungi live in the soil and um, because they work together with the root. So there are several types of mycorrhizae. Uh, depending on the plant species, they form symbiosis with. And here are the types of mycorrhizae. Um, first and foremost, the most common and most commercially important type is endomycorrhizae or arbuscular mycorrhizae. They form symbiosis with uh, most ornamental plants like roses, daisies, or any kinds of ornamental grasses. So these are, these are very, very common and very, very um, important from a commercial standpoint. There are another type called ectomycorrhizae. And um, ectomycorrhizae are less common, representing only 10 to 15% of the total mycorrhizal community. And uh, they live on the roots of hardwoods, conifers, oaks, eucalypts, for instance. Also, orchids have their own uh, special type of mycorrhizae called orchid mycorrhizae. Azalea and rhododendron and other ericaceous plants form symbiosis with ericoid mycorrhizae and the rest represent a very tiny portion of the mycorrhizal symbiosis. For instance, the strawberry tree, Arbutus uh, plant, has uh, a very specific type of mycorrhizae called Arbutoid mycorrhizae, and the ghost plant, the Monotropa, um, has its own uh, mycorrhizae called Monotropoid mycorrhizae. So these are highly specialized types, and, and, and they don't normally have commercial importance. And um, the two commercially relevant types are endomycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae. And we're gonna focus on these only because these are commercially available for use in ornamental production. Now let's quickly go through the process when the mycorrhizal fungi and their plant roots establish their mutualistic relationship. And this is called the colonization process. And first the mycorrhizal propagules have to germinate upon contact with uh, root exudates. This is a very important fact that uh, mycorrhizal propagules need active roots in their proximity to germinate. That is why we 
recommend applying the inoculants directly to the root or, or in the root zone. Once the propagules have germinated, the fungal hyphae enter the root tissues. And if they are endomycorrhizae, they will enter into the cortex tissues and inside the cells. In case of ectomycorrhizae, the hyphae forms a sheath around the roots and enter only the intercellular space of the root tissues. So they don't enter into the cells in case of ectomycorrhizae. This is the main difference, in fact, between ectomycorrhizae and endomycorrhizae. Um, then the, fu the fungi start to grow inside the roots, forming different structures, storage organs for nutrients and water. And uh, the hyphae also proliferate into the surrounding substrate to take up nutrients and water and um, transport them to the plant. We say it normally takes three to four weeks for the symbiosis to establish and for the fungi to provide these benefits to the plant. Therefore, it is important to introduce the mycorrhizal fungal propagules as early as possible to give them time to establish themselves. And this is particularly important if you are uh, growing short cycle plants. Also from commercial standpoint, it takes um, uh, less mycorrhizae to colonize a juvenile plant from a small root zone than a larger one, but Blair is going to talk about uh, the economics in a little bit. So how do mycorrhizae work? In the soil, plant roots are normally limited to a uh, volume to explore for nutrients and water, and this is called a depletion zone. Once the nutrients and the water are taken up from this zone, the plants start to show symptoms of nutrient deficiency and, and water stress. So what mycorrhizal fungi do is that their hyphae grow out of this depletion zone and absorb water and nutrients from around this uh, soil volume. So basically they depend, they expand um, the soil volume to extract nutrients and water from uh, by their hyphae. And, and with this, they increase the absorption area of, of roots and, uh, um, and this could be up to 50 times. So let's see what the difference is between root hair and mycorrhizal uh, fungal hyphae. So we often get the question from growers, so why do plants need mycorrhizal fungi to take up nutrients and water? They have roots. And when answering this question, we try to point out the function and structural differences between plant roots and, and the mycorrhizal fungal hyphae. So the mycorrhizal hyphae are much smaller in diameter than the smallest root. So they can explore a greater volume of soil-less media, providing a larger surface area for absorption. Also, the cell membrane chemistry of mycorrhizal fungi is different from that of plant roots. So the whole length of the mycelia is capable of, of, of absorption as compared to just the tips of the root themselves. Because in case of the root hair, uh, the cation or the nutrient absorption occurs only at the root tips. Also, um, there is very important to, to note that in case of the root hair or in case of the plant roots, uh, the plants can take up nutrients from the available or the soluble pool. While in case of mycorrhizal fungal hyphae, the hyphae produces um, enzymes that can help uh, break down uh, inavailable, nu inavailable nutrients or non-soluble uh, nutrients. So they expand this uh, pool of nutrients uh, for uh, the plants that is available for the plant. So these are the main um, differences between the, the plant roots, the root hair, and the mycorrhizal fungi. So when we talked uh, a couple of slides ago about the expansion of the of the, the the root zone and uh, and when the mycorrhizal fungal hyphae grow out of the depletion zone, that is true and that it, that applies to field conditions. But what's the situation with with potted plants with container uh, production? So in these cases, plants grown in containers, you know, they don't have the opportunity to grow out uh, out of the depletion zone because they have a limited volume of soil to explore, and this is uh, in fact the depletion zone. So what mycorrhizae uh, do is it can penetrate into the smallest pore spaces uh, in the soil or in, uh, in the growth media that, is, that would be unavailable to the roots. So this is one uh, mode of action. Also um, in, in uh, potted conditions, um, there, are, um, there are situations when the plants cannot have access 
to all the nutrients in the pot because of their uh, chemical bonds and um, bound nutrients require microbial activity to be released for the plant uptake. So, and what happens is mycorrhizal fungal hyphae produces enzymes, for instance, phosphatases, that converts nutrients into bioavailable forms. And also, there are symbiotic bacteria that in fact lives in symbiosis with the mycorrhizal hyphae. So this would be a symbiosis of a symbiosis. Um, and they feed on the hypho exudates and they in fact um, help um, the plant take up nutrients because they uh, solubilize uh, different nutrients. And also uh, the mycorrhizal uh, activity increases the production of soybilizing enzyme by the plant root. So there are many different modes of uh, modes that the mycorrhizae can help in container production, not just in field condition. So, and now let's, now let's talk a little bit about mycorrhizal inoculant products. So in the inoculant products, we, we can call active ingredients or mycorrhizal propagules are present. And um, in fact, mycorrhizal propagules are structures that uh, are capable of forming or reestablishing a mycorrhizal symbiosis with plant roots. And in fact, our team at Mycorrhizal Applications um, have worked together with APCO, the Association of American Plant Food Control Officials, to uh, define these, um, um, these definitions, the mycorrhizal propagules, endomycorrhizal, ectomycorrhizal propagules, what mycorrhizal fungi is, and in fact, these uh, definitions just uh, got approved. So we are ha very happy to, uh, to work with uh, these regulatory bodies and regulatory agencies to, to define what mycorrhizal propagules are. So to go back to commercial products, there are two main types of um, propagules in the mycorrhizal products. These are spores of mycorrhizal fungal spores and the colonized root fragments. The spores are normally dormant and, and they germinate slower than the root fragments. These are very resilient structures. And um, on the other side, they have colonized these um, mycorrhizal inoculant products contain colonized root fragments as well. So these are colonized by the mycorrhizal fungal structures and they contain these structures, for instance, vesicles or mycorrhizal fungal hyphae. And um, these are very quick to germinate uh, under uh, uh, certain conditions and they provide a very fast high flow regrowth and, and colonization of the plants. So these uh, two components make up the mycorrhizal um, inoculants active ingredients. Uh, the carriers could be different and I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about it. So the commercially available products that are on the market have three main formulation types. And one of them is the granular formulation. These are normally clay granules or some sort of calcium carbonate or calcinated uh, products as they contain these as carriers. And these are normally relatively low propagule uh, concentration products. That means from somewhere between 100 to 200 propagules per gram. These are bulky because they're, pop they're propagule concentration is low, the growers have to apply larger amounts. So it is, um, it is a bulky product, but uh, these are excellent for soil incorporation because it's very easy to mix in with the um, different growth media and also um, artificial soil products. There are powder formulations. We call these suspendable powder, powders, not soluble powders, but suspendable powders. Because if you think about it, the, regardless of the carrier, there are mycorrhizal spores and, and tiny root fragments are in the product. So these never go into solution. So they will just suspend in, uh, in, in the water solution of a powder, for instance. The solubility of the entire product or the entire formulation normally depends on the carrier, which could be humic acid that is very water soluble or could be clay that is just suspend feels suspendable. Um, and um, these are from low to high propagule concentration products. You can find from 100 propagules to up to 20,000 propagules. So there's a very wide range of variability in terms of uh, propagule concentration. 
and there is a very flexible application uh, methods that available for these products. They could be applied um, via uh, drench when when uh, when it's mixed in in a water and solubilized, or it could be incorporated in in growing media. So there is a there's a different uh, there there are many different ways to apply these uh, suspendable powder products. And last but not least, there are liquid formulations on the market as well. These are normally high propagule concentration products, and um, there are two different types. There are aqueous and non-aqueous formulations. These are um, um, very easy to apply. So they could be normally uh, mixed in with water and drenched or, or could be applied through dip irrigation or dip and and also drip irrigation as well and uh, with the aqueous formulations however there's a there's an issue which is the limited shelf life so they normally could be stored for six months however the non-aqueous formulations are very stable and uh, they have uh, at least two years shelf life and in fact i have to mention that mycorrhizal applications um, have a um, uh, couple of patent applications for um, the non-aqueous formulations because that's uh, that's a very novel product that we just developed recently and put on the market. These are non-aqueous formulations and they have exceptional uh, solubility and, and great application uh, characteristics. So this is something to consider in, in your operation. So when we talk about uh, mycorrhizal inoculant products, one thing that we uh, emphasize and we would uh, pay attention to is the diversity of fungal species because there are different species that are responsible for different functional benefits so for instance one species is very efficient in phosphorus uptake the other one is very efficient in uh, nitrogen uptake the third one is um, very effective uh, reducing droughts stress uh, effects on the plant so it's very important to have a diversity of fungal species in a in a particular product that we apply, so that these conditions, when these conditions uh, occur, they, uh, the mycorrhizal fungal species would be there. Also, the species change with plant phenology and plant physiology. So, in an early stage, for instance, uh, a tomato plant in a seedling stage have different needs for nutrients. Uh, less uh, requirements for phosphorus uh, uptake, for instance. But at a later stage, when they form the flowers and the fruit, they will require higher levels of phosphorus. So the difference between these phenological stages is their need, and in fact, their production of chemicals in their root exudates that triggers the mycorrhizal uh, spores and root fragments to germinate because the plants control the symbiosis. So if the plant senses that uh, it needs help uh, in taking up nutrients or protecting from stressful conditions, then it starts to produce those chemicals in the root exudate that triggers the mycorrhizal spores and root fragments to germinate. Therefore, the diversity, we believe, is very important in mycorrhizal products. And um, I have a graph here from a prison. It's actually a published paper where, they, where the authors and the researchers uh, looked at the diversity, the mycorrhizal fungal diversity on the roots uh, throughout a whole season in two different plant species. And th these were the Prunella and Antenaria. And so what you can see here is the, uh, the months uh, on the horizontal X and uh, the percentage of the mycorrhizal species or the mycorrhizal genotypes in uh, different uh, times or different sampling times. So without going into the details, what you can see that the colors change uh, over time during the season. So that means that the relative importance and uh, the presence of mycorrhizal fungi changes over time during the season. So they, the plants, or the same plants have a different mycorrhizal community on their roots in July than in October. So that's why it's important to have a diversity and multiple species of mycorrhizae 
in an inoptimum product so it can um, it can be available to the plant when it's needed and let's talk a little bit about the benefits from the use of mycorrhizal inoculant product. So in the greenhouse and in the nursery operation, mycorrhizae increase the nutrient uptake and, and increases uh, the water use and, and the nutrient uh, use efficiency. And so therefore there's, there's less nutrient leaching out of the pots. There's a better growth response in return uh, and uh, the growers uh, have Vegetative, better vegetative growth and more flower buds. In the sales channel, um, there's a better survival rate during transportation because if you think about it, plants are transported in, in um, semi trucks and um, they are exposed to stressful conditions during transportation. There's no light, for instance. And um, also at the retail stores or big box stores, um, there are um, extreme stressful conditions like the, the, the small pots could eat up, up to 120 Fahrenheit degree under the sun uh, during the summer. And what mycorrhizae do, do is uh, basically it protects the plant and, and at the end um, you see less loss in, in retail stores and, uh, and, and these big box stores. And, and this is particularly true when, when uh, we talk about watering because there's a very irregular watering schedule. Uh, in these uh, big box stores. Also at the final customer, uh, there's a better survival uh, rate and a quicker establishment because ornamental plants can be uh, transplanted in a stressful landscape environment. And, uh, and you know, we cannot really expect from all the homeowners and all the uh, final customers to take care of the plants as the plants would need it. So ultimately, um, the plants are exposed to stressful conditions and um, this is where the mycorrhizae can help so there's a quicker re-establishment and a better survival rate also there's an increased grower profits uh, and improved nursery and plant brand recognition and loyalty and reduced plant guarantee returns so what that means is that once the customers uh, recognize that um, this particular uh, nursery uh, uses mycorrhizae and these plants uh, treated with mycorrhizae have a better survival rate, they will go back and, 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 uh, and produce return purchases. Um, and uh, this would be um, helpful. And also this helps in, in, in brand recognition as well. So after all this, let's uh, talk a little bit about um, the growing practices, the, the effects of nursery and greenhouse growing practices. Uh, you know, how they can interact with mycorrhizal inoculants and, and how they affect the efficacy of the products. So first, let's look at the growing media use. In nursery and greenhouse operation, there's an increasing trend of the use of artificial, art, artificial substrates where mycorrhizal fungi are absent. And due to the nature of these substrates, they do not contain mycorrhizal propagules. Therefore, the application of uh, mycorrhizal inoculant in in growing media use is needed. And uh, we've seen a great response in a wide variety of growing media from peat moss to perlites to vermiculite. And, and mycorrhizae will well, work well in, in practically all commercial uh, growing substrate, all commercially available uh, growing substrate, particularly when they contain um, high levels of uh, insoluble sources of, of phosphate because uh, they produce, for instance, phosphatase, and, and that really helps um, uh, plant growth. Hydroponics represent a special growing medium when plants are grown in a liquid or inner soil-less medium. And under these conditions, um, all the nutrients and water are supplied by the grower. We are often asked, uh, can we apply mycorrhizae in hydroponics, or does it make sense to apply mycorrhizae in, in these conditions? And the answer is yes. Uh, not just because we want to sell the product, obviously, but because mycorrhizae can provide benefits in these growing conditions. So first of all, mycorrhizae can survive in an aqueous environment with adequate aeration, which is normally required for the plant growth anyways. So there's no particular uh, requirements for the mycorrhizae. And um, in fact, there are uh, several aquatic plants 
that live in symbiosis with mycorrhizal fungi. So there's there's no problem uh, using mycorrhizae or applying mycorrhizae in uh, hydroponic condition. In hydroponics, uh, mycorrhizae help take up mineral forms of the supplied nutrients. So this is one of their benefits, but the most important benefit here uh, are the increased absorption area by increased root biomass and high flow network. So mycorrhizae promotes root branching, and this is how it increases, in fact, um, the effective heating capacity of the roots and the nutrient uptake. And this facilitates, uh, obviously, the nutrient uptake and, and, and plant growth, um, ultimately. So let's talk about inoculation. Um, Inoculation is a process uh, when we place the mycorrhizal propagules in the root zone. When we talk to customers and if they didn't see any effects of the inoculant product, in almost all cases, the problem is the application that the propagules weren't applied in the root zone. So once colonization, the, uh, colonization of the plant roots um, occurs, it lasts for the life of the plant. So no reapplication is necessary in most cases. And this means in perennial crops that only one application will take care of the plant for, the, for its entire life. For annuals, inoculation is necessary, obviously, at every planting. And um, the most economic and best uh, physiological responses can be achieved by early application. So this makes sense uh, if we consider that early application results in early colonization and longer duration of the symbiosis and its benefit to the plant. So also since the application rates are based on the size of the root zone, higher rates being recommended for larger roots, it is easy to understand that growers can get away with less mycorrhizal propagule for young plants with a smaller root zone than for larger ones with a bigger root zone that require more mycorrhizae to colonize. So it's, yeah, it's, um, it's easy to, to understand uh, this calculation. And uh, one important thing is that you cannot overdose with mycorrhizal fungi. Um, when you apply more inoculum or, or more propagules than is needed, the plants just won't produce uh, these, roots ex these chemicals in their root exudates that triggers um, the, the mycorrhizal propagules to germinate. So they are just going to be uh, sitting in the soil and waiting for these root exudates uh, to come when when the conditions become stressful uh, for the plants. And there are different ways of inoculation and um, mycorrhizal inoculants can be applied, for instance, uh, via soil incorporation. Um, so the mycorrhizal propagules can be mixed in the growth medium. And, and in fact, this is one of the uh, most popular uh, application methods. Plugs can also be dipped in a solution containing mycorrhizal inoculant products. Obviously, uh, soluble powders or liquid inoculum can come into account in this uh, particular case. And also, dipping is very efficient in bare root perennials as well, um, like trees could be uh, dipped in a bucket of uh, mycorrhizal inoculant solution. The only thing that um, what um, growers and customers uh, have to pay attention to in this particular case is that um, the mycorrhizal propagules tend to settle uh, in, a, in the solution uh, at some point. And uh, so it is recommended to agitate uh, this uh, solution uh, so the mycorrhizal propagules would uh, evenly distribute over the, would be evenly distributed over the uh, root zone. Um, Besides that, boom spray application is, uh, is very efficient and very common in greenhouse operations and also um, branch uh, application. Propagules could be applied uh, in the reservoir tank in hydroponics. So there's, um, that's a very easy way to uh, utilize mycorrhizae in this uh, growing uh, system. And last but not least, uh, inoculants can be mixed in the uh, in vitro growing medium in the in vitro propagation of ornamentals or, or perennials, for instance. And um, it is important to note here that uh, only properly disinfected propagules can be applied 
um, under these conditions. So because these are sterile conditions and they could easily um, contaminate um, the, the in vitro growth medium if they are not sterilized. So then let's talk about uh, pesticides a little bit. Uh, and it is well known that plant production products can affect the efficacy of the inoculant products. And uh, the most sensitive time period is right after the inoculation when the propagules start to germinate and establish the symbiosis with the plant. So this is the period when application of harmful pesticides should be avoided if possible. It is pretty straightforward that fumigation kills mycorrhizae along with uh, all other soil microbes. Insecticides and herbicides are considered relatively safe when applied at the recommended rates or um, at the manufacturer uh, recommended um, application rates. Some of the fungicides, such as propiconazole, captan, for instance, are harmful uh, to the mycorrhizae. And uh, it is not surprising, though, uh, considering that mycorrhizae are fungi. So some of the fungicides have, have negative effect on, on mycorrhizae. And um, so these are the fungicides that should not be used together with mycorrhizae, at least not in the inoculation stage. Um, we, we, in fact, put a comprehensive list of fungicides and, and their compatibility with endomycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae together, and um, it is available um, at our website at mycorrhizal, um, at the mycorrhizal applications website. Um, you can see it on the bottom of the slides, um, the mycorrhizae.com, and um, you can uh, download this. There's a long list of um, fungicides that, um, that we um, went through and uh, we put this list together. So it could be very helpful for, uh, for the growers. And um, if you have to apply fungicides that uh, could potentially be harmful to the uh, mycorrhizae, um, there are different factors that you have to consider um, when applying these fungicides. For instance, um, the negative effects can be significantly reduced by the timing, by the choice of timing of the application. So for instance, um, if um, a fungicide a, has a negative effect on mycorrhizae, uh, the mycorrhizae should be applied first. And once the symbiosis is formed, uh, the fungicide could be applied because it has uh, it's going to have um, less detrimental effect once the symbiosis has formed. Also, the choice of application uh, mode can help for example, applying fungicide foliarly be less likely to hurt the mycorrhizae in the soil unless it is a strong systemic compound. And also lower rates applied at multiple times are uh, more mycorrhizae friendly. Another aspect of um, pesticide use is the use of disinfectant and sterilizing agents in the greenhouse, for instance, or sterilizing the irrigation line. Uh, and these are normally harsh chemicals such as chlorine or hydrogen peroxide. But if you apply them according to the manufacturer's recommendations, they are safe to use uh, with mycorrhizae. So most of the time, you just have to wait a few hours after the chemical application or ozonation, um, because these are normally um, very short-lived compounds. Um, they have a very short half life. Uh, and um, so it just takes um, a few hours to wait, and, uh, and the mycorrhizae can be safely applied. Um, if we don't have much experience with a chemical and its effect on mycorrhizae, we say that uh, if the chemical doesn't harm the plant, it will likely not harm the mycorrhizae. So this is true for most chemicals, except for fungicides, of course, um, because um, fungicides represent a different um, group of chemicals here. Then as for fertilizers, the same rule applies as to pesticides regarding the sensitivity of the mycorrhizae. So the most sensitive stages stage is when propagules germinate and the mycorrhizal symbiosis form. So in general, over-fertilization is harmful, and particularly um, with nitrogen and, and phosphorus. And Blair is going to talk about details and at what rate, for instance, uh, of the nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil are harmful. But I just want to briefly mention that high levels of fertilizers work as sleeping pills in case of, of 
mycorrhizae. So they don't kill the mycorrhizae, but put them to sleep. Because plants sense uh, the high levels of nutrients in the soil, you know, when you over apply the, uh, the fertilizer and they stop producing those chemicals in the root exudates that would trigger the germination of, of the mycorrhizal propagules. And um, they don't need much uh, help to take up nutrients under these conditions. So this is uh, why, uh, why this is happening. However, when the levels of nutrients in the soil decrease, the plants start to produce these trigger compounds in their root exudates and induce propagules to germinate and the symbiosis to form. And the mycorrhizae can start providing the benefits to the plant. And um, one important thing I'd like to note here, it is about the use of fertilizers and mycorrhizal inoculants together. Nutrients have to be in the soil for the mycorrhizae to take up and, and transport to the root. So mycorrhizae make the nutrient and water uptake more efficient, for instance, by reducing the loss of nutrient leaching. So, so that's, uh, that's very important that, that mycorrhizae is not a fertilizer. This really helps um, taking up all the nutrients more efficiently and the water from the pots. And, um, and one particular aspect that I'd like to mention here is the nutrient leaching. Um, this graph from this graph is uh, from an excellent study with uh, potted California coast sunflower done at UC Riverside, and the researchers applied Osmocote. This is a, a slow release fertilizer at three rates, zero uh, half rate and full rate of fertilizer, and compared the nitrate and phosphate leaching from the pots with and without mycorrhizae. And the results were very clear that mycorrhizae reduced the amount of nitrate and phosphate leaching at all fertilizer rates. So what you can see on these um, three uh, graphs is that the no osmocote half rate and full rate and um, the white diamonds uh, represent the amount of nitrate leaching and the black squares uh, shows the level of nitrate leaching with mycorrhizae. So as you can see that every single, uh, almost every single time the uh, mycorrhizae treated pots had significantly less uh, nitrate leaching from, uh, from the pots. So in, in summary, this means that more nutrient was utilized, more nutrient was available for the plant to uh, take up and, and uh, this provided a better growth response. Then um, the last grower practice I'd like to cover today is the root pruning and uh, to understand the interaction between root pruning and mycorrhizal activity. First, we have to quickly review the functioning of the roots. So nutrient and water uptake occurs through the fine roots of the plants and those plants that have lots of fine roots and dense root hair are normally more efficient in nutrient and water uptake and therefore are less dependent on mycorrhizal activity than those with coarse roots. And plants with coarse roots have a less efficient nutrient and water uptake, and therefore they are they heavily rely on uh, on help from mycorrhizae on mycorrhizal fungi. So then uh, when we look at the effect of root pruning, we see a significant reduction of fine roots. And on the image on the left side shows in fact the natural root system um, of a in fact this is a green ash nursery tree. And the one on the right shows the root after root pruning. So the effect of root pruning, I think it's very obvious here um, on, this, on these photos and the need of the use of mycorrhizal inoculants in operations, um, practicing root pruning is not, que not questionable. And after root pruning, plants have a significantly uh, reduced root functioning and absorption area that will clearly uh, benefit from using mycorrhizal fungi. And the same applies, uh, in fact, to the practice of harvesting bare root plants or perennial uh, rootstocks, for instance, because this, there is a huge loss of, of fine roots during harvest and, and plants are exposed to stressful conditions. All right, I got to the end of my portion of the presentation. And now let me turn it over to Blair, who is going to talk, walk you through um, some practical aspects of mycorrhizal inoculant products. Thank you, Joseph. 
Now, um, the part of my pre of this presentation that I'm going to cover is taking the power of science of mycorrhizae that Joseph's talked about today and applying it on the practical level at your greenhouse and nursery. Over my uh, career in horticulture, I've known that um, grow no grower is the same as another grower, that everybody has different production practices and has different preferences. And obviously there's different environments in which people are growing in, as, um, both within the structures they're growing in or outside. And obviously every year is different um, as far as weather. So we all have different challenges. So that's why we offer different options. And these options, uh, can be a granular type of product for or a powder for soil incorporation. There also can be a plug dip or a liner spray option. Those are with the suspendable powders. And then we can do media drenches as well as we have products that work with um, the application of running through an injector or drip tape or boom sprayer or some type of a um, uh, minimal uh, um, a minimal amount of water application option. One of the key things to understand about mycorrhizae is that um, for most applications, as Joseph talked about, you only need to have the one option. And as you can see here, if you're trying to get one product to do both a soil incorporation and as, use as a drench, that the ultra fine options are, and the soluble max are probably some of the best options that we have available. There are options that are available that are both an endo product as well as an ecto, endo ecto product, as well as now we are, have a specific product that is ecto only. Our first type of product um, incorporation method that I'd like to talk about is soil incorporation. Um, probably one of the easiest things people can do is they can order a premix that already contains the mycoapply mycorrhizae. If you are interested in that, please go to our website, as Joseph talked about below, mycorrhizae.com. And in that, there is you can find out who your um, rep is that covers your part of the of the of uh, North America, and we can refer you to a soil manufacturer that would be able to support your request for a pre-manufactured soil. If you want to do the soil incorporation yourself, um, one of the most important things you're going to need to do is to be able to have a open hopper in your production line, and you can incorporate it a little less than a pound per cubic yard. As I said, there are endo and ecto options available. Um, we generally ref prefer and suggest that people use the granular product if, if at all possible. And as you can see, your cost per 72 cell tray, if you apply it during propagation, is very affordable at two cents per tray. For those people who are smaller scale, who are buying a, uh, a germination or propagation mix in a 3.8 bale, uh, cubic foot bale. Um, once it's uh, reconstituted, you can add in about a qu quarter pound per bale, and uh, you just have to thoroughly mix it and be comfortable with that because you need to make sure that for a uniform product in your plug and propagation trays, that you need to have a very uniform and well mixed product. Um, and then uh, for people who are purchasing 2.8 cubic foot bags, a little more than a tenth of a pound per cubic um, bale. Um, per soil once it's opened and mixed. Um, and again, the uh, uniformity of the application of the uh, uh, inoculant is, is crucial. Plug, dip, as well as a bare root spray are other options. So for smaller growers who are looking for this option, we often suggest that um, this is a great uh, opportunity for people to trial product. So if you take your plug trays, you dip them in, put them in a container with about two ounces of the ultra fine product that is agitated. And then you do a dip, pull it out, just like you might be combining with other dips that you have. And that's a good question that people will ask us. You can combine it with other products that you would combine in the dip, do the dip of the roots, pull it out, set it on the tray. And then as that's draining, you can be dipping the next product until you're all done. Now, the great part about this is that you can do it ahead of time and let the plug sit so that mycorrhizae starts to happen and the clock starts to be working with the mycorrhizae. And then once you transplant them there, that treated um, plug or liner will then continue on. As you can see, it's about seven cents per tray. So this is a little bit more expensive per, per way to treat. But again, the cost is really a low compared to a lot of other treatments that are out there in the, in the market. 
For bare root transplants, as Joseph talked about, um, which are becoming more and more popular, whether it's roses or perennials or fruit trees, shade trees, shrubs, um, whether you're a nursery or greenhouse, most ever, all operations have some form of bare root that they're working with. You can, um, we suggest a spray actually um, compared to actually a dip, because Joseph talked about that uh, with a dip, you're gonna have some issues potentially with some settling of, of the inoculant. But if you do some type of spray, and if possible, you can do a non-ionic surfactant so that it adheres better to the roots. And then you can, if you want to store it a little bit, but, um, and then you can plant it out into the field. Um, so it doesn't have to be immediately sprayed and planted. You can, you, there can be a short period of time in between. So there's good options both for plug dips for smaller growers and then the bare root option, which has become a, a very popular component um, for um, nurseries as well as greenhouses. Now the traditional drench, uh, this is a product that we've had on the market for uh, multiple years, is the ultrafine product. This is available both in the United States as well as Canada. It has a clay carrier, it's ARMRI listed. Endo and ecto options are available. The key important component with this product in usage is agitation, because if you don't agitate, the clay that is in there will gum up your system and you can have issues with that. But if you have some type of, of agitation, which can come with your injector, or you can use the agitation um, like that's hooked up to a uh, power, power drill that will then agitate the product, um, you can effectively use this product to have flowed through your system. There, this is about four cents per plug tray. Again, a very affordable option and um, is a popular option both on both sides of the border. The injector products. This is where we've been focusing a lot of our energy um, earlier, um, I should say recently, and um, the, the key part here is that ease of application. You can run it through an injector. As Joseph talked about, the, the carrier will go into solution. The mycorrhizae itself will, will still be suspended, but it will easily flow through the system. 20 grams, think about it, a very small scoop of product will do 100 gallons of drench. So basically you drop it into your stock tank, you do a quick mix and you're ready to go. There are, um, as you can see, the cost is five cents per 72 cell, so cell tray. And the cost per plant is, is less than a, even a 10th of a cent per tray um, per plant. So the cost of treatment is, is you know, almost not, not even countable. Um, so that we have three options here. The first is the injector endo, um, has the most soluble carrier and is can be is a great option for most greenhouses and many nursery crops. As Joseph talked about that the ecto um, crops are conifers and hardwood trees. And so that would be the injector endo, I mean ecto option. So that would be for conifers, many hardwood trees, Christmas tree growers, and if we have any uh, um, nut tree orchards in, in our audience today, this could be a great option for hazelnuts, pecans, as well as chestnut. Now, the one that's in the middle there is the injector endo organic. This is an armory listed product, so it has a, a, a different humic carrier, but it's a great option for organic production, edibles, consumables, and other types of, of plants where people are looking for, even if they're not growing organically, but they want to be able to be using OMRI listed products, as well as this has become, are starting to become a, a popular product for use in hemp, which is often, um, they're trying to use uh, OMRI listed products in that type of production. Okay, those are the, application options that uh, many people have asked us about, and we have products that uh, support. And I'd like to go through some frequently asked questions that we have. So can mycorrhizae be used with other biological products? And the answer is yes. Mycorrhizae works very well with other biological products such as beneficial bacteria found in echinovate, a fungicide, or in trichoderma products like root shield or TerraGrow. I think it's important to, for people to understand that mycorrhizae is very different. And that really is the second question we have. So is how are mycorrhizae different than other microbes? So first of all, you only have to apply it once. So if we go back up to like the uh, trichoderma products, um, you're going to have to repeat them because they're based upon more of a treatment where mycorrhizae is a lifelong change for the plant. 
Next thing is without the plant, they can't survive for a long-term period of time. They are, as Joseph talked about, they are obligate symbiotes. So they depend upon each other for long-term survival. Another thing is unlike bacteria or trichoderma, which you apply it and you have a, a peak of, of population within the soil and then over a period of time they decrease, mycorrhizae is just the opposite, that you apply the amount that you apply during your application and then over a period of time as the root system um, and the root mass continues to grow, the mycorrhizae continues to proliferate and will increase over time. And lastly, they thrive under a diverse range of conditions. So whether you have high sodium, low sodium, you have high pH, low pH, you have temperature ranges, all of these different things where in your substrate can change, where the mycorrhizae are living, they can live and, and prosper. And as remember Joseph just brought up, we are selling to rice growers. So you think about in a totally aqueous situation, in a hydroponic situation, in soilless media, and in mineral soil, they all work and, and, and mycorrhizae um, prosper. So the next question is, what is the recommended fertility program for the use with mycorrhizae? So this is a important question that I get asked a lot because historically people have had high fertility levels and when they tried mycorrhizae during those times, they didn't have success. And as Joseph brought out, if you don't, if you, if the plant has plenty of water and plenty of nutrition all its life, it never goes through a stressful condition, it doesn't need the mycorrhizae and it doesn't um, initiate the chemicals that would initiate the relationship with the mycorrhizae. But as you and I both know, that might be the ideal, but that is not the case over the life term of the lifetime of the plant. And that's why we recommend that for best results when using mycorrhizae, that having a nitrogen level below 200 parts per million or lower. Now, where often people used to grow 400 parts per million or higher continual feed all the time, that's changed. And, and the reason for it is economics, as well as just that they realize they can grow a better plant if the plant it has lower levels of nutrition. And this is the same thing with the phosphorus. The P205 can be 100 parts per million or lower. So these higher levels of phosphorus also, if people are using a single species of mycorrhizae, that single species that's most commonly grown, used out there, will shut down in higher levels of phosphorus. And that's one of the reasons why we use the multiple um, consortium of, of uh, different species of mycorrhizae, because some of them are more tolerant of higher levels of phosphorus and will continue to function, provide benefits to the plant, even under higher levels of phosphorus. As for also, people ask questions about the nitrogen levels. This, it doesn't matter if, it's, if the nitrogen is coming from a nitrate form or an ammonial form, it doesn't matter. Um, you just wanna have your levels below 200 parts per million, which is the commonly recommended rate that most people are using at this time. And the other important thing is that the better that the plant um, utilizes the, the, the nutrient and fertility that you're applying it, you think about it, you're getting more value from it. So all of us are trying, as we know, it's very difficult to raise prices out in the marketplace. So if you're trying to control your costs more, mycorrhizae allows you to help control your costs because your fertilizer is getting um, less, as Joseph just illustrated, there is uh, less, uh, more absorbed and there is less, it's passed through to the environment and there's just less waste. So let's talk about what are some of the possible cost savings that people can experience out there with mycorrhizae. And the first of these is, we talked about reduction in fertilizer costs, more utilization by the, by the plant, better uh, uptake. And the key thing too is the mycorrhizae only needs to be applied once. So um, that is um, very important. And then the second thing is less reduction in pesticide application. So mycorrhizae is not a registered pesticidal product, but what it does is it reduces the stress of the plant. And by reducing the stress of the plant, it will reduce the frequency and the level of infestation that potentially pests could happen with the plant. Water usage. As we all know, water is a finite resource out there. You know, some growers have um, a finite ability to pump. And so any water usage is um, more efficiently is, is better. And obviously more that's absorbed by the plant rather than passing through is even, even uh, more important. Um, 
the next one is we talk about is we talked about less runoff again whether you're you're looking at it that you live are growing in an environmentally sensitive area where you don't want to have the the nitrogen and phosphorus runoff is an issue, or you're just trying to save costs because you realize everything, every nutrient that flows through that pot and out of the bottom is, is money lost. So mycorrhizae helps you to reduce your costs in that way. Fewer plant loss. As you look at, uh, you look at some of the, the studies that are showing what, how the cost of plant material is increasing compared to like 10, even 10 years ago, We've gone to more vegetative products. We've gone to larger um, containers. So if you have fewer plant loss, that can really add up and become significant and help during the, the transplant. So, uh, there's just less plant loss during transplant. The next thing is more uniformity of crop production. You have more bench run. We're moving more to automation as a way to uh, alleviate issues that the nursery is experiencing with uh, less labor in the market and less labor availability. Mycorrhizae helps you to have a crop that is more uniform, and by being more uniform, it's going to be more um, capable of being able to use um, automation to be able to maximize that performance. And what are some other benefits that you might see? First of all, cost savings continue again. We talked about it earlier. The trucks, when you deliver your plants, that the, they're going to trucks are going to come. I mean, the plants are going to come off looking better. And we all know the quicker the plant is sold, the better it is for you because you get paid quicker. Whether it, you're an, in, you know, an independent garden center or you're a grower retailer or you are a pay by scan grower, the quicker the plant sells, the better. So the better they look coming off the truck or the better they look coming up to put in your, in your um, garden center at the, at the front of your operation, um, the better it is for you and for the customer. Improve shelf life. Joseph talked about this. So you're gonna have less plants maintenance costs. Think of how much it takes out for people out there to go out there and have people out there, um, whether you're a garden center or you're at, at a big box store, to go out and groom those plants to make sure that they look good and that, that they're, they're desirable for the customers. If they can look better naturally with less costs, it's better for everyone. And then obviously you wanna have less plant loss at retail. It's amazing how many plants do get lost at retail and then get put on carts, they you know, they sold at reduced costs or they have to get taken back to the dump pile. And then the last thing is that increased survival rate in the landscape. So this can be with flowers and trees and shrubs, but the most important thing is that customers are finite. You know, it's not like, I mean, yes, there are a lot of customers out there, but many people have a certain area which they shop. So if people go to your store, and they have greater success with the plants you have, they're gonna be more likely to return, and those return sales are the most important sales you wanna have and to, and to maintain and to increase. And then also, if you have any type of program in which your plant material is guaranteed, if you, the growers have, um, the cust I should say, the gardeners have greater success with your product, there's gonna be less returns, and they're gonna be have a, um, speak more positively of your institution. And we think about all of social media, where people are rating um, businesses upon their performance and how people are treated. That is all based upon the concept of how the customer feels. And if the customer has a positive gardening experience because of the plant material that, that was supplied to them, was grown with mycorrhizae and will help them to have greater success than they will. So it's a great way to get more positive reviews for your plants as well as for, um, the nursery um, that will be selling your plants. Another point I wanna bring up, many growers put their name on the plants. So if you sell a substandard product that is more likely to die, your name's associated with it. But if you also grow a plant that it positively performs and, and uh, you know just causes the person to have a positive experience with gardening, your name is also gonna be associated with that. The same thing also applies with branded plants. So if people go out there and buy a specific branded plant and it doesn't perform, guess what? They're gonna say, well, do I really need to spend that extra money for that branded plant? Or, oh, I buy that branded plant that has been treated with mycorrhizae. Oh, I can't believe how well it's growing in my, in my garden. That's exactly what I wanna buy next time. And as we all know, 
the plants that are branded out there, people have the opportunity to make um, better returns on, and so that having a positive experience with that branded plant is crucial. So in summary, the final message is we need to think of mycorrhizae as a type of crop insurance. It's not one of those things that the federal government um, puts out and puts forth a program that you have to sign up for, but it is kind of a biological crop insurance. It enables your plant to withstand um, less than optimal growing conditions or other, other types of op, um, less than optimal um, conditions. And will whether it's in the growing environment, during shipping, when it's in transport, at the retail um, garden center or the big box store, and also in the landscape. It's very important to understand that mycorrhizae will allow your crops to shine. Thanks so much, Blair, and thanks so much, Joseph. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take some of the questions now. So we do have quite a few questions, um, so feel free to stick around for a little bit, everybody, and uh, learn a little bit more. So first question we have is, are certain kinds of mycorrhizae better suited to higher pH soils than others? Yes, this is Joseph. So yes, different species are responsible for different functional benefits, and uh, we made sure to compile a consortium of species that uh, provides benefits from uh, increased phosphorus uptake and also uh, non-optimal pH. So with the multiple species in, in microfly branded products, you uh, get a uh, guarantee or we can uh, say an assurance that um, that the plants will uh, perform well under uh, non-optimal pH conditions. And in fact, um, we conducted a couple of trials on salinity tolerance, for instance, when the uh, pH is um, extremely high and um, the mycorrhizae treated uh, plants in this particular case apple trees uh, overperformed uh, just the regular uh, non-treated plants so uh, yes the answer is yes and uh, with the uh, consortium of uh, four species in our products we uh, you can uh, get the benefits of uh, the use of mycorrhizae under non-optimal uh, soil pH conditions. Uh, this is Blair. I was going to also add that in the Cultivate talk that we gave last year, um, one of our researchers, uh, Leonardo, um, talked about research that he'd been involved with that uh, when plants are exposed and, and have relationship with mycorrhizae, that they have greater access to the nutrients over a broader range. So when we typically think of the av availability of nutrients, um, we think of those historical charts that we all had in our plant science classes that show certain nutrients are available over different ranges. Mycorrhizae, with, because of that relationship, allows an ability to access those nutrients. It allows the nutrients to be able to um, available over a, a slightly broader range than would be the plants would have access to under normal conditions. Great. We have another question about fruit trees. Um, this person says, I have mature tropical fruit trees in pots. What products would you recommend for that? Okay, uh, so if they're in pots, I, I would suggest you could do a drench. So you could uh, drench the root ball in the pot. Um, most tropical plants are going to be endomycorrhizal, but uh, I suggest you go to our website where we have a document, a resource document called uh, Family and Genera. You can look up the uh, plant specifically and you can uh, identify if it is a endo or ecto uh, product or whatever type of mycorrhizae product it is. If that's if it's not listed there, please reach out to us directly and we'd be glad to help you to find out exactly the type of mycorrhizae that your plant needs. Great. Um, and so can this product also be used with root vegetables and how would that affect a crop like tobacco um, or something that is smoked or consumed? Yes, they can be used in uh, vegetables. The only thing that um, in this case you have to consider is that brassica uh, vegetables, the brassicaceae family, 
do not form symbiosis with mycorrhizae. So the cabbage, um, cauliflower, for instance, broccoli, they just don't form the symbiosis. So when you apply, you won't see the benefits um, in these instances. In other cases where uh, the symbiosis establishes, um, you can see benefits of uh, the increased nutrient uptake and uh, ultimately a better growth response is what we normally um, see. To answer the second part of that question about specifically about tobacco, um, mycorrhizae is used in commercial tobacco production and uh, so there shouldn't be any issues in where um, tobacco is, is, is commonly known a very uh, stressful plant for the soil. It can kind of, uh, um, it's, you know, deplete the soil. Mycorrhizae can help um, to pull more of the nutrients that are not um, readily available in the soil and make them available to the, to the uh, tobacco plant and ultimately potentially help you have improved um, yield in your, in your crop. Great. Um, and would an end consumer need to reapply mycorrhizae um, in a nursery stock that was grown with them? The answer would be no. So if you've applied it once during the production process, um, the end consumer would not need to add it in there. Now, if they add some more in their potting soil that they're purchasing or in a, a garden center uh, aftermarket product there, it's not going to hurt it. As Joseph talked about, you can't overdose, um, but it uh, could be an additional uh, shot or increase. Um, one of the areas actually where we do suggest the potential for more than one application is, however, in a um, perennial landscape situation where you might have a specimen tree or some expensive landscape material that probably every three, four, five years you're going to want maybe to do another application just to give it a booster shot to keep the mycorrhizal um, populations up there and so that the plant, because the plant's worth so much money, the minor amount that you're applying for mycorrhizae just makes sense. Okay, um, and kind of a similar question. Um, someone says that a few of the mycorrhizal products that they've used and at least one company that they've spoken with um, insists that a reapplication of these products is necessary every six to eight weeks. Um, they're kind of wondering um, what what's going on there. Is that is it a marketing tactic? Is there something that they're missing out? Well, uh, typically, you know, every three three to four weeks for the symbiosis for, to occur with the mycorrhizal species, and then about another four weeks be before the plant starts benefiting. So if you're applying it at that frequency that's mentioned in the question, you're way over applying. Um, I think it is more deception. I think it's the, the company that's selling it is, doesn't understand the science. Because the science is there that you think about the plants in nature. If we go to a forest or or a meadow or any situation where it's undisturbed, where mycorrhizae is naturally occurring with the plants, they don't get reapplied every year. As Joseph talks about, as the, as the root mass expands and there's a greater absorption area of the plant, the plant continues to establish a relationship um, with newer um, mycorrhizae that's in the soil and then the mycorrhizae hyphae continue to grow out and come in contact with other roots and, and, uh, and spread the, the mycorrhizal inoculation throughout the soil. So you don't need to re, uh, reapply like the, the, uh, that label suggested. And just one more thought here um, to add uh, to Blair's comments that it actually could depend on the purpose of the product. Because, you know, if a, if a product is uh, mostly um, used for use as a fertilizer or used as a nutrient supplement, but it contains uh, mycorrhizae as a secondary component and the primary use is to supply nutrients, yes, it could be reapplied, but from the mycorrhizae standpoint, you know, if you apply mycorrhizae multiple times, <clears throat> it won't really impact the efficacy, but uh, uh, it, it just certainly depends on the purpose of the product. Gotcha. Um, and so do they survive winter conditions? Someone's asking, you know, if it's below 32 degrees, um, are they going to survive that? Yes, the answer is uh, yes, they survive because they live in symbiosis with the plant roots. And if the plant roots survive, they live inside the plant roots and they will survive as well. So there's no problem there. 
and the other part is that in some of the coldest areas of the world are plants that have relationships with mycorrhizae so it's not an issue and then if you go to the opposite situation with heat again in some of the warmest places in the world those plants survive and have the increased root mass because of the relationship with mycorrhizae so mycorrhizae is as i mentioned earlier can take an extremely diverse um, amount of growing conditions and um, survive. And the key, as Joseph brought out, is is its relationship with the plant and where so much of the mycorrhizae is in contact or within the plant um, uh, is a very important part. So if the plants can survive, as Joseph brought up, the, the mycorrhizae should be able to survive. Okay, uh, can high organic matter be negative for mycorrhizae? Yeah, I, actually, the, it'd be just the opposite. It's a positive. So if there's high organic matter in the soil, there that means there's more components in which the mycorrhizae and its increased root mass can then mine from the, from the soil to bring in and provide benefit to the plant. Um, and also, with the high organic matter, which will help with the soil structure, um, is a positive. And one of the components of uh, benefits of mycorrhizae that we didn't talk about today is that mycorrhizae over time period can improve soil structure. And there's been um, studies that were up, um, actually um, glomulin that came out um, by the US, uh, USDA ARS um, program back that shows that and that in agricultural soils or in landscape soils are continuing to get reused over, over many years. And um, it is one of the best ways to be able to improve that. There's some great practical applications where that's been done. If we look at uh, um, some of the uh, gardens that have been down out there that have done it over time where they've done the proper soil maintenance and they've added mycorrhizae, it actually can have significant benefits to improving the soil. So high organic matter is a positive thing for mycorrhizae and is a positive thing for the soil. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, this person does mostly annual and seasonal plantings. What products do you sell that can be incorporated at planting into flower borders and landscape beds? Um, I didn't mention it, but the uh, granular products are, are, are some of the easiest that can be incorporated. You can uh, put them in the soil and rototiller them in or um, as one option. Another option is you could do the planting of the bed. And then if you have the ability to do a spray tank where you could mix it up, and uh, um, once it's mixed up in a tank um, and, and then apply that just like you would like some type of liquid fertilizer um, is another option. Um, so between the drench option and the soil incorporation option, I think those are good two options for landscapers. Okay, and if you're applying for the first time in an orchard, how do you get the mycorrhizae down into the soil where the growing roots are? Well, it depends on the... Uh age of the orchard if it's a newly planted uh, orchard uh, it could be applied at the time of planting either as a um, root dip for instance or it could be even sprayed uh, with a backpack sprayer onto the roots uh, at the time of planting but right after planting um, a drench uh, would be sufficient to to provide the mycorrhizae in established orchards uh, drench is also uh, a good option because with the use of water, irrigation water, um, we can easily move the, the propagules into the root zone because the propagules are very tiny. The spores are normally 50, 70 micron and the root fragments could be up to 200, 250 micron. So they move easily uh, in the soil with their, in the root zone. Um, when we talk about drenching uh, the inoculant, we recommend first to wet the soil profile so it would be easier for the uh, mycorrhizal solution to travel down in the soil profile. So first wet the soil profile with water and then apply the solution that contains the mycorrhizae. So that's going to be uh, probably the quickest and, and most efficient way in, in case of um, either established orchards or, or new plantations as well. And so what is the depth that a drench um, would carry the fungus into the soil? It really depends on the soil type. 
because uh, the propagules uh, would move down in the in in uh, sandy soil very easily and and uh, probably a deeper into a deeper uh, layer. But uh, what we normally uh, say is um, that mycorrhizae can travel with the water. So as deep as the water goes, the mycorrhizae uh, would likely to go uh, down as well. So um, that really takes care of the of the of the movement of the propagules into the root zone. So it it really, it really depends on the uh, on the soil. As I mentioned, in the sandy soil, it's easier and and, and deeper, but uh, in um, in like heavy uh, clay soils, it's it's probably uh, less uh, deeper. So yeah, I would yeah I would I would consider these uh, factors. Great. Um, and so, what products would you recommend for a hydroponic situation? And how long does mycorrhizae survive? Um, underwater, sorry, uh, underwater. So the product that I would suggest in a hydroponic situation would be one of our injector products or when we're going to be releasing next year our um, non-aqueous liquid product um, because they're the most soluble and they're going to be most easily moved now. The current injector products are all humic based, so it's going to change. Um, it's going to add the humic to the to because it's a carrier to the uh, fertilizer blend that you're trying to apply. So that would be what I would suggest. Um, and then you talked about how long it would survive. Well, as Joseph explained, it's going to be able to survive the whole life that the plant roots survive because you have to have some type of of aeration in in the water. Um, for the plant to survive. And th that same aeration is what is needed by the mycorrhizae for it to survive. So the mycorrhizae's life will be connected to the aeration, which which also affects the life of the plant. Okay, and I think we're running out of time here. So I'm just gonna do a couple more questions. Um, someone's saying that they learned a few years ago that there's a very specific host mycorrhizae relationship um, do mycorrhizae and plant species need to be closely matched in order to colonize effectively? That is a good question. Um, and the answer is for endomycorrhizae, they're generalist. So if you go to our website, again, to the resources page where it talks about the, the families and genera resource document, it'll outline which, which plants are associated with which type of mycorrhizae mycorrhizae, but uh, specifically endomycorrhizae or generalists. Now, ectos, on the other hand, um, are more specific in which they um, are connected with. So if you're dealing with a ecto plant, which would be a hardwood tree or, or most hardwood trees or conifers, um, please contact the uh, mycorrhizal application specialist and they'll be able to work with you so that you use the appropriate uh, ectomycorrhizae. Then if you go to the aracoid mycorrhizae, the aracoid mycorrhizae, again, they'd be very specific that you have to have the aracoid mycorrhizae for the aracoid plants. And the same thing would be for orchids or the arbitoid or the monotropoid. So those are very specific, but endomycorrhizae itself is, is a generalist. And luckily for us and in horticulture, about 80 to 85% of all plant material are endomycorrhizal. Okay, uh, can you apply mycorrhizae to a finished compost before it's added to a soil blend? And how long will it survive before a host plant is, um, is introduced? All right, so if you're doing composting and you're um, following the regulations, the, the temperature range that you need to have uh, authorized or, or, or fully composted material is going to be so hot that it's gonna kill the mycorrhizae. So mycorrhizae, we um, tell our customers can go up to about 120 degrees, 140 degrees. And so um, what you're gonna want to do is you wanna make, for, so the composting, the compost that you're making is totally done. And then once that compost is totally done, it's, it's cooling down um, and that you're to the point where it, if you applied it, it wouldn't damage the, the plant then that's at the point you would want to put it in that you would apply the mycorrhizae into that part. And so, um, 
but you can so you have to you can't have very fresh green still composting compost and applied to um, use mycorrhizae with it but any mature product that, that is more stable um, would be appropriate for the application of mycorrhizae then the second question you ask is about what the, the shelf life is we typically suggest we're doing some internal research this mom, uh, moment to uh, support this and hopefully expand it in the future but we generally suggest if you add mycorrhizae um, to a compost or to a soil, um, you need to consume it or it needs to be in in um, stored no more than six months. And um, the mycorrhizae itself, in, if it is in a soil, um, can, can last up to two years. There's some research out there that's lasting a couple years in the soil, but it's sitting there in a rhizosphere of a soil. It might not be in contact with the plant root, but it's there in a more stable structure as opposed to in a bag or bale or uh, you know even a pile in in um, uh, which would be with a soilless media or something like that or compost. Great um, and so what are some of the good signs of inoculation after three to four weeks how do you kind of know that it's working? So the three to four weeks is where the mycorrhizae is the plant is starting to benefit. So then it's then about another four weeks before we say that the grower is going to start seeing differences in the crop. So you're not going to see those at the three to four weeks. You're going to see it at the at the eight week period out. And that's why when Joseph talks about the reason for application during the propagation stage, first of all is economics. And second of all is it because of the lower, um, smaller um, root vo um, volume. And the second is that it starts the clock. And where we're talking about a four week clock before the plant starts to benefit and an eight week clock um, before the grower starts seeing benefits. The longer that, that it is there, it, the quicker it's gonna have and, and have visible benefits. Some crops, some growing conditions, some situations you're gonna see it sooner, um, but we generally use the eight week as, as, as the benchmark. The other important thing to understand is that if a portion of those eight weeks is within a small soil volume. So let's say a plug or liner, you're not gonna see a lot there because there's not a lot of soil volume that it can express itself and expand its, its uh, um, root absorption area. It's not until you move it into a larger, more finished container or into the soil, mineral soil itself, is where you're gonna see the mycorrhizae benefits um, take off sooner and be able to be more visible to the plant and more visible to the grower. Okay, and I think we're going to wrap it up with one last question here about annuals. Um, in an annual flower program, is it still worth using mycorrhizae if you're changing out flowers um, every 12 weeks? So this would be in a, I'm, I'm guessing a landscape program where you're changing out flowers every, or, or in a container so that you're replacing containers. The answer is yes, because if you're, if it's 12 weeks that you are uh, uh, having the finished plant for display, then you're going to get 12 weeks of benefits there. And then you're going to get part of the benefits as it's being grown to a finished product before it gets planted in the soil. So yes, in a landscape situation, mycorrhizae does definitely make the, the, the has the benefits um, and uh, you would be able to benefit in a 12, 12 week period. Okay, well, thanks again to both of you um, for this great presentation. I hope everybody learned a lot. Um, please keep an eye out for an email that you should be receiving within the next couple of days with a recording to the webinar and the Q&A. Um, I hope that you all will join us for the next one. And thanks again, you guys.